in Federalist I, Publius placed before the people of the United States a challenge. He states that it has been reserved to the people by their conduct and example, the opportunity to decide on an important question, whether or not societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend on their political constitutions for their political constitutions on accident and force. People of the United States had a responsibility to meaningfully reflect and carefully decide whether this new constitution would adequately protect their liberties. We have that same responsibility today as we work to live under that constitution, continue to um, operate a society that, that serves for everyone's life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And we're pleased to have a conversation today with two people who are playing a role in that conversation. We're joined by two pollsters, one who is more seasoned and one who is just getting started. John Zogby has been a pollster and opinion researcher for decades, has an excellent track record on a variety of questions touching many aspects of American politics and daily life. Luca Ruggieri has just been in this business officially for about a year but has already done some great work. And we're excited to talk with both of these gentlemen about why they chose to do this, what they think their work does to, to contribute to our national conversation. And so if uh, we can do so, I welcome John and Luca. I'm glad to have you with us today. You've been at this for a while. Could you just tell our audience briefly what drew you to polling and how you got started with the firm that you're running now? Well, there were three career paths in the 70s and early 80s for me. I was a college professor. I was a community activist, in, in, including an uh, actual community organizer, president. And uh, I was also uh, uh, someone who was always fascinated by so in the early 80s. I got a chance to run for mayor of my community and to do my own polls. And uh, I guess to quote Thomas Marshall, I'd rather be white president. I lost as mayor, but I knew ex exactly how much I was going to lose by. And I thought, hey, you know, this is pretty good. So in 1984, uh, I started playing from the bottom up, worked my way up to ultimately Murdoch Empire, Reuters, NBC News. Luca, you're just getting started. I take it you've not yet been a college professor. Tell us a little bit about your story and how you came to start Patriot Polling. Yeah, well, I'm not even in college yet. Uh, but the way that it started is that um, I, uh, a buddy and I, who I uh, started Patriot Polling with, uh, his name's Arhan Call. Uh, we were on the train, and I'm really more into the political side, and he's into uh, data science and that sort of stuff. And we were talking. Um, this is uh, the summer of 2022 about the polling and how we thought, you know, th these midterm polls are going to be terrible. The polls in 2020 were terrible. The polls in 2016 were terrible. What is the differentiating factor there that separates the good polls from the bad polls? And you know, we're all thinking about uh, what are we going to do to get ourselves into college? So I had the idea, you know, it, well, why don't we try conducting a few of our own polls? I mean, I, I've got the political side down. You've got data science down. So, you know, what's the worst that could happen? And then uh, before you knew it, uh, we had Nate Silver in 538 uh, picking up our polls. And we were, uh, I think, the first uh, polling company to be founded by high schoolers to be put on the 538 aggregate. And, you know, once that happened, you know, it really got the ball rolling and it turned into something a lot bigger than we thought it would, but it's been a terrific experience. Sounds great. Well, but I think every entrepreneur could tell you a similar story, right, John? You start something and it goes lots of places you didn't think it would. A lot more work, too. Exactly. Oh, exactly. I got a D in statistics by freshman year in college. I love to tell folks. Could each of you take just a minute and reflect on the role of polling in American politics? And, John, I'm going to start with you and then we'll go to Luca as soon as you're finished. Um, it, it's organic to a democracy. A democracy is based on the will of the people of I and for the people, which means that as policies are made or debated, essential ingredient, not the dominant, and all polling does is offer a scientific approach to, uh, to uh, obtaining what that public is. You know, there have been other methods years in other forms of government as well of collecting public opinion, we add some science. Luca? I agree with what John said, but I also think that polling does have some influence on the way that things turn out. I can just say, you know, uh, in the Senate race in my home state of Pennsylvania, 
um, about a year ago uh, in the Republican primary, which is really what what uh, got me uh, really interested in polling. Uh, the the polls orig- uh, they they showed uh, originally Dave McCormick and uh, Dr. Oz in, in a virtual tie, but um, towards the end of the race, uh, the, this uh, you know sort of Trump candidate uh, Kathy Barnett, she started. Uh, rising in the polls, and a lot of uh, McCormick supporters uh, switched their vote to Oz uh, because they thought that Barnett was going to be it was going to be a race between Barnett and Oz. And in the end, it ended up being Oz that won by less than a thousand votes. So I do think polling can have uh, a material I- a impact on on elections, and and a lot of policies are decided based on polling. And uh, but I do think it's important. Uh, uh, polling serves a very impo- important role in giving both. Uh, elected officials and the public an insight into what the uh, general uh, national opinion is on on, on certain issues or, or local opinions or whatever it may be, but it serves a very uh, important role in our democracy. John, is there a tension then, if, if what Luke is describing makes sense, is there any kind of tension between poll, polling and pollsters and individual choice? Is it, is it, how does it help or um, does it put thumb on the scales? How does how does that happen? Is that how would you describe that? That dramatic. It's not that dramatic, and I'm not so sure um, that what Lucas says is right. Um, you know the, the the dominance or the heavy influence. Look, you didn't need a poll uh, to give you a sense that Richard Nixon was going to destroy George McGovern. There are people out there who say, "Well, you know, this guy doesn't have a chance. I'm going to vote for the underdog." There are so many factors that are involved, how and why people make a decision. I'm not so sure that it's among those dominant factors. Do I like the candidate? Does he or she present themselves well? Do they represent my core values? Um, those are important things. People can tell us you know, answers to those questions. Let's let's get to the the, the craft of polling itself. Luca, how did you put together questions as you were building the polls that you did over the past year? What what was a good question? How did you decide what to ask? How did you decide how to ask it? We just asked questions the way they were going to come up on the ballot, because I think if you add anything else in there, uh, it, 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 there's a lot of personal bias that starts to get injected. So, you know, you just go to the ballot. Uh, what we would do um, the whole reason why we were able to poll is because we used this method called IVR, which is uh, basically a robot uh, calling a bunch of uh, people and reading out questions. And what it would do, it would ask you, uh, you know, in the uh, Georgia Senate race, w- are you voting for uh, Raphael Warnock, the Democrat, or Herschel Walker, the Republican? And that would be it. Uh, and there would be, and then there would be the undecided option. But we didn't try to add any sort of uh, other uh, descriptors uh, to, to our polls because we think uh, that's the way it's going to come up on the ballot and that's the most accurate way of uh, prefacing it. John, I know you've done a lot more polls as you've uh, done so. What what else have you found goes into the, the preparation of questions? I think, first of all, it's very important, as Luca mentions, to, um, to include the name as it's going to appear on the ballot. That's really consistent with ultimately how people make their decision. But then I also, uh, we as a company, have, have never really relied simply on the horse race. I want to know what people's values are. So whenever we'll pull on a candidate or policy, we'll ask our questions more attuned to um, how does this best express who you are? Which of the following best describes how you feel or where you stand? We'll try to get a core values. You feel agree or disagree that terminating a fetus is manslaughter? Uh, do you believe on the issue of abortion, ultimately a woman has a right to choose? Oftentimes, on that question, all the time, we will get crossover. We'll get people who actually feel that abortion is manslaughter and that a woman has a right to choose. That allows us the sophistication to know which candidate is ultimately addressing those voters who are going to be first who are conflicted on various things. John, can you give me a maybe a story that you've encountered in your work where the values told you something that maybe you didn't expect to find or that turned out to be more deeply revelatory of where a, a question was headed? I'm going to give you a famous story uh, that I've written about, and I'll try to keep it short. But 
and daily tracking for NBC News and Reuters presidential race in uh, 2000. We had Gore going up. Ultimately, Gore did win the popular vote, as you know. We're the only ones that captured or by one half of one percent uh, uh, in the popular vote, George W. Bush. But I added a question in, um, and it may seem frivolous, but I told, I said to voters, I live in the land of Oz, and, and this year there's an election for mayor of Oz. Uh, one of the candidates is the Tin Man. He's all brains and no heart. And another of the candidates is the Scarecrow. He's all heart and no brains. Would you vote for the election we're held today? And it came out 46.2 for the Tin Man and 46.2 or the scarecrow, that told me an awful lot about people's values, the fact that probably weren't going to know who won that election. And as you know, we didn't know who won that election until the Supreme Court died. I remember that story, right down to the hanging chads. Um, yes. <laughs> Luca, as you're getting in and building um, polls, what, what do you think polls can tell us and what maybe not? I think that what polling does... Uh, provide is uh, a broader snapshot into the electorate um, and it can give you a, a general sense of uh, what uh, the electorate is thinking and uh, but it's not 100% accurate which I think has been uh, a, a problem with the way that people interpret polls uh, especially in the last couple of, of election cycles because uh, in a lot of these close races you know a, a point or two or three makes a big difference in the outcome uh, but people hold polling to, to such a high standard that uh, the way that an election comes out, they, they, they expect polling to be down to the dot. But the, the, the problem is it's just really tough to get it to, to that point of accuracy. So I think polling is a better uh, measure to, uh, for a less accurate, uh, not, not a 100 percent accurate read of the electorate, but it gives you a good idea of what people are thinking. You're never going to get a perfect result with polling. Yeah, I, I think that. First, for starters, I think we as a profession have misled uh, the public in terms of expectations. I've played that game for years, and I came out almost always on the right side of, of close races um, in terms of my record of accuracy. But I always knew that that was ephemeral. 10 to 14 percent of voters now tell us in exit and post-election polls, I made up my mind on election day which means that uh, there's a lot of fluidity, a whole lot more fluid uh, than, than you think. 2016, I heard Luca just say that the polls were terrible. When you look closely at the national and then the statewide polls in battleground states, you will, it, it is unmistakable, there was a trend line away from Hillary Clinton and towards Donald Trump. That's not because... Uh, necessarily that uh, on the day before the election, they came out and said Hillary Clinton's going to lose Pennsylvania or Hillary Clinton's going to lose Hampshire, Wisconsin. It was because each of the last nine days, Hillary was going down a point or two and Trump was gaining. That that trend line was unmistakable. So what you're saying, that the, the trend was important. That was the information value there is that you, you could see there was a pretty strong signal. It wasn't it wasn't vacillating all over the place. No, it was not vacillating all over the place. There were outliers. I mean, there were polls that didn't capture it. But for the most part, if you know what you're looking for, and that's the thing that I try to do when I do forums like this, don't rely on a pollster who has an R after their name or a D after their name. There's going to be some spin involved. And mm. Look for good independent polls uh, with your tracker. Let's talk a little bit about um the the practice of polling and whether or not that's changing or evolving at all and kind of the electorate's relationship to pollsters and john i'll start with you and then we're we're going to come to luca as as maybe a an interesting window into what could be coming but how how has the relationship between the electorate and pollsters changed in the time you've been at this and you could talk about that and how people uh, interact with folks on the phone who are calling to do surveys. What, what do you see in that relationship over time? When I started in late 1984, Stan, we averaged 65% response rates. 
Everybody had a landline, 96% of households. And culturally, socially, we answered the phone. It was not uncommon to hear on the other end, shh, please be quiet. Somebody's calling me from New York and has questions to ask. I've got to do this. That was then. There were virtually no answering machines in 1984. Uh, and socially, people were glad to answer the phone. In fact, here's something to chew on. It wasn't uncommon for an older woman to answer the phone and say, oh, no, you don't want to talk to me. That's the demure housewife that does not exist anymore. And it's also a woman telling a total stranger, hey, I'm home all alone. So, yes, things have changed dramatically with technology, answering machines, star six, nine, so on. In our instance, much more reliance on online. And also, we do live phone calls and we do call cell phones. Cell phone is just not a friendly uh, technology. Luca, how did you conduct your polls? And after you're done answering that question, I, I want to talk about maybe what you see in among your classmates and peers and how they react to polls. Well, let's start with, how'd you do yours? How did you do your polls? Oh, uh, we, we didn't have that much money to start off with. So we couldn't do, uh, you know, one of the big operations that like ABC has with, with real human beings calling all, all these phone numbers. So what we found is a system called uh, IVR, which is pretty much a robot that calls a ton of phone numbers. Most of the phone numbers either don't pick up or they hang up as soon as they hear that it's a robot. But if you do it enough times, you're going to get a suitable polling base so we we would just uh it's 15 cents per call so uh we would be uh we were able to get away with paying you know two three thousand dollars per poll where you know a, a a much larger uh sort of uh traditional polling operation would, would have cost a lot more than that so uh what but what we had to do since uh we only had access to landlines um because of uh I, it's some federal regulation that you can't uh, use uh, uh, an automatic caller to, to call uh, cell phone numbers. So we could only uh, use landlines. Uh, we had to, there was a lot of uh, weighing involved with our polls because we weren't getting a, a, a very accurate sample of the electorate. I mean, because it's much older, uh, much, uh, the people who have landlines now are, uh, don't reflect the, the general makeup of the electorate. So we had to, uh, you know, get uh, weigh our polls uh, the, 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 once we weighed our polls, we had a much different outcome than the raw result. What do you see in your peers, your, your friends, your classmates, and so on? What, what's their relationship to polls? Do they even think about them, pay attention to them? How do they, how do they interact with polling? They, they don't, uh, they, I don't even think they think about it. It's, it, people, people do think a bit about politics, but it, it, it never gets to the electoral level. I mean, people, I, I have never heard any of my classmates talking about polling or, or, or how they think an election is going to turn out or anything like that. Luca, how do you think polling contributes to or supports self-government? I think that polling, uh, it gives elected officials an insight into what people think. I mean, because otherwise you have to wait until an election to know what people are thinking. But with polling, uh, politicians, I mean, they want to, most of them want to do something that's popular. So they, a, a lot of times, if, if polling sh shows that something is unpopular, uh, you know, our elected leaders won't do that and they'll do what the people support. So I think it gives uh, our leaders a, a really good insight into what uh, people are thinking and it allows uh, their views to be implemented w without an election having to take place, or at least some of their views. We all uh, want to feel connected and want to know that you know, in our inner cells, we may have feelings, but where do we stand with everybody else? I think especially in a, a, a modern era where there are so many ways to isolate and atomize, what polls do is it offers us a connection uh, to the rest of the world in a scientific way. In terms of matters of public policy, it's not only important for policymakers to understand where majorities are or or consensus ideas are, but it's also that we measure intensity. On a typical issue, you, you may have 
60% who agree and 40% who disagree. But among that 40% who disagree, there is a solid half of them who are so intense, they're ready to march in the streets with pots and pans, make a lot of noise. Those are the sorts of things that, that polls have to try to measure. That's what moves policymakers. But what, Luca, do you hope people will be watching for and how do you hope they will use polling and how do you hope they will consume that data going into the next election cycle i think uh you know polling should not be as important as what they think is best for the country i think people should uh choose their uh, base their votes on, on on the candidate that they support instead of what they think polling indicates i i think what polling highlights for this next election is, is that you know uh most people really want an alternative uh to what we have now uh people conduct polls and it's like 70 80 percent want somebody new uh to, to to run in the election but as you can see that that's probably not going to happen uh we, we've got the two uh front runners uh, are very unpopular. I think that what polling should do is offer an insight, uh, offer people an insight into the way that the country is thinking. Because it, it seems often that people, uh, they don't understand that their viewpoint is, uh, there are a lot of people with other views across the country. So I think that what polling can do is really illuminate to people that there are opposing views and, and uh, th there's a, a lot more diversity of thought than uh, most people realize in this country. And I think that could be very useful. I would ask, ask that those who are on air or on the opinion pages, be smarter. Instead of a very one-dimensional reading and interpretation, I wish that instead of looking always at the more apocalyptic uh, results of a poll, how we disagree, what separates us, what makes us angry, that uh, those who interpret would take a look at uh, plenty of areas of consensus, plenty of areas where there is potential to bridges, that be part of the conversation as well. And then the third thing I would say is, I, I just wish we could get predictive and prediction out of the language. We don't predict, we suggest, we say who's ahead, say what a trend line is, but then, um, the results come in on election day and um, it's not the pollster's fault or it's not anybody's fault. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for making time to speak with our audience today. We appreciate uh, what both of you are doing to help our fellow citizens, help all of us make better decisions, understand how the country is thinking about issues, uh, and hopefully that helps motivate each of us to do more learning ourselves and make wiser choices. Thanks very much to both of you. Thank you. Good luck, Luca. Thank you. Great meeting you.